The task of this lecture is to start grasping the particular attributes and characteristics of quantum space, where actually architecture takes place in concordance with mechanics and kinematics of the quantum regime now and to try to figure out what type of new characteristics emerge in our conception and navigation, map making of this space. Through this, what we try to do is to figure out the characteristics of the new type of intelligence artificial intelligence, which is inbuilt in our complex calculus, which emerged out of the extension of the exponential function as an encoding bridge from the real line to the circle. For this purpose, the first thing and the most important we have to figure out is how the real line looks like how it manifests in quantum space. The essential difference and what makes it consonant and possible to communicate naturally with the harmonic domain, characterized always by an undisclosed center of synchronization, which does not have to be always the geometric center of a circle, as we will see later, is that we have something which appears as redundant, what is called a gauge freedom in quantum space. Mechanically, we can grasp it very easily as we saw already, through the countable discrete integer number of circulations around the circle. All this is inbuilt in the multivalency of the notion of an angle. With a complex exponential function, we have managed to express every point on the circle analytically in terms of the values of the complex exponential function which we have called a phase. So each point on the circle correspond to a particular phase. Now we know that phases should not be thought only as numerical entities they should always bring with them some kind of structure. And this is the structure now, which is transferred through the exponential bridge as an algebraic bridge. Recall that in the classical space, the exponential function has been the encoding bridge from the additive group of the real numbers to the multiplicative group of the positive real numbers. And this is a bridge which is isomorphic, so it makes these two domains indistinguishable structurally from each other. The extension now of the exponential function to the circle, because precisely of the multivalency of the angle, is not possible to preserve this kind of isomorphism. This means that with the complex technology of the exponential function, we go to a deeper level of structure, which is possible now to distinguish the discrete integer harmonic invariants. So, in our manifestation on the geometric screen, we do not have an isomorphism 
as in the real case, as in the case of the real line. But what we we have is a homomorphism, and this homomorphism has an irreducible kernel. This kernel is what characterizes now the undisclosed center of synchronization. So, whereas in the real case, in the case of the real line, of the real numbers, we do not have the means to characterize the undisclosed center of harmonic synchronization pertaining to area, which, of course, we can decode through the logarithm. In the complex domain now, the extension of the exponential function to the circle provides the necessary refinement to encode the harmonic invariants, which are simply the integers thought of as harmonic frequencies in a setting that we will see in more detail, in terms of an irresolvable, irreducible kernel of the exponential homomorphism from the real line to the circle. And it is this kernel now which characterizes what synchronization is about and it relates precisely to the harmonic invariants. In this sense, our geometry of classical space is not adequate to manifest these refinements. The quantum space, endowed with the ideas of mechanics, translations and rotations is possible to encode the harmonic invariants, what appears as a kernel in the algebraic language, in terms of an irresolvable space of discrete stars. This is the basic idea which is actually of a topological nature, as we will see, which makes the whole difference at the simple level of the real line in classical space in comparison to quantum space. So, let's start to see how the real line looks in quantum space. Recall that the points on a circle are characterized through the complex exponential function in terms of phases. The same phase corresponds to an angle irrespectively of the integer number of circulations around the circle. So the phase has precisely the same value irrespectively of the number of circulations. This now is a topological characteristic which is emerges. Recall that in the case of the real line, we also had a topological characteristic which came out of the irrational numbers. The whole technology of real calculus in the calculations of limits and derivatives is based on the assumption of continuity. So there are no gaps or holes in the definition of a continuous function. And derivatives and limits procedures which lead to convergence pertain 
to this necessary condition of continuity. And continuity is not a geometric condition, but it is a topological condition in relation to the real line. So the real line is a continuous space topologically. Now, if we go to the circle, beyond continuity, we have another topological characteristic that manifests. And this characteristic has to be qualified and abstracted in an appropriate way. The whole issue about the multivalency of the angle as pertaining to circulating around has to do now not with continuity, which is already there, but with the issue and the characteristic of connectivity. And connectivity is also a topological characteristic. It is not a geometric characteristic. The results of the different types of connectivity have to be qualified geometrically. The main issue is that geometry and thus architecture requires always simple connectivity. So the case which is emerges from the multivalency of the angle has to be unfolded appropriately in a simply connected way. The idea of connectivity can be explained as follows. Imagine that we want to navigate through circulation in this region here from one point to another. Of course, we can consider this type of paths. The issue now of multiple connectivity, which comes out of the multivalency of the angle, is that I can consider a simple path connecting these points, but I can at the same time circulate around an integer number of times until I connect any two points. So any two points here, any two points here can be connected not in a simple way as in the case of a line, but in an infinite number of ways depending on the number of circulations around this region here. This is a topological characteristic which is called multiple connectivity. And multiple connectivity now is the topological obstacle which came together with the multivalency of the angle, of the notion of the angle, and of course the extension of the exponential function from the real line to the circle. So classical space, the real line is always simply connected, whereas the circle, because of the multivalency of the angle, becomes multiply connected. There is a way to understand this through loops, so simple closed curves which start at a point and end up at the same point. If this space here was simply connected, any loop could be contracted to the initial point. Now, precisely because the circle topologically 
is not simply connected, but it is multiply connected, it is impossible to contract loops at the same point. So here topologically, the interior of the circle is thought of as a topological hole. This is how the issue of multiple connectivity is encoded in topological language. And if we want to do geometry now in quantum space, we have to deal with this, this obstacle. We have to devise encoding and decoding bridges going from multiple connectivity to simple connectivity. The resolution of this issue is already implicit in dealing with the method of Archimedes. What we have already talked about, about unfolding the circumference of a circle into a linear magnitude. The issue now is how we can think of it in topological terms. And the issue now is how in this multiply connected space what we think of as having the characteristics of quantum space. How can this space be unfolded in a simply connected way? Because the unfolding of this multiply connected space in a simply connected way will allow us to perform geometry and thus have architecture in the simply connected unfoldment of this quantum space. Now, in topology, the idea about this is called the covering principle. And the covering principle originates in the conception of Gauss and his best student, Riemann. The idea is the following, that dealing with the obstacle of multiple connectivity amounts to unfolding the circle into a helix. The helix is going to play the role of the universal covering space of the circle. What is the characteristic of the helix? The helix is simply connected. So, going from any point to any other point on the helix, this can be done in a simply connected way. But the reason that this is possible is that the helix is structured not only in a continuous way, but it is structured in a series of discrete integer stairs. The different stairs of the helix, which is covering universally the circle, are indexed, so we have a partition spectrum in terms of the integers. So, we can understand now the integers together with their additive group structure as the discrete countable stairs of this helix. In this way, each integer corresponds to a winding number along this helix and equivalently to a winding number on the underlying 
circle. The winding number is characterizing the circulation which takes place along the circle. What is the characteristic now of the partition spectrum of the helix? Again, we do not think of the helix as an operational geometric object. We think of the helix as an encoding bridge from the circle, which is multiply connected, to a simply connected geometry. The helix now is the one which will give the means to perform geometry in quantum space. But this geometry beyond the continuum brings along with it a partition spectrum which consists of the discrete integers indexing the different stars. What is this partition spectrum now amounts to? Consider loops that circulate around the circle. All these loops can be simply classified according to their winding number. So all loops, all loops which wind around the circle the same number of times belong to the same block of the partition spectrum of the helix. So the simply connected helix brings along a partition spectrum which consists of blocks indexed by the winding numbers, the discrete integers. Now, this discreteness, which lives together with the continuous in a peaceful, democratic way, is appropriate and it is enough to lead us to the geometry of quantum space. As we said, this can be done through objective probabilistics and essentially quantum probability theory. The issue is that we do not know in advance the discrete harmonics, how they are distributed. along the helix. But we can use the partition spectrum now indexed by the windings to figure out the relation between the harmonics which will appear if we think of bounding this helix from above and below so in harmonic terms, we can think of a self-interfering stationary wave propagating along the helix, reflected on the upper boundary and heading back and interfering essentially with itself, through which we get the discrete spectrum of harmonics. But now we can qualify topologically through the winding number. Now the idea is, the basic idea is that with the helix in quantum space, as the universal covering, as the universal covering of the multiply connected circle on our screen, will give us the possibility to resonate with the discrete harmonics because we have on the helix 
the discrete partition spectrum. It is this discrete partition spectrum now which what it achieves is what we will call the relation of homology. The idea of homology is that all simple loops winding around the circle which wind around the circle the same number of integer times simply belong to the same block of the partition spectrum of the helix. In this way, the area which is in enclosed here can be uplifted can be uplifted from this region homologically according to the discrete winding numbers from space into time. But this time here, beyond the continuous aspect, brings inbuilt the discrete winding numbers, which will be the means to resonate with the discrete harmonics. So, whereas in the case of the real line in the classical space and classical real valued calculus has only the aspect of continuity through which we can grasp the irrationals and all the limit, derivative, convergence, and integration also procedures as pertaining to the real numbers. But only the continuity of the real line cannot sense, does not have the means to resonate with the discrete harmonics. So there is no way with the real calculus than discreteness coming from the harmonic invariance can be manifested on our screen. This is possible now through the extension of the, of the exponential function to the circle and the complex calculus. So with the homology, this idea of homology, this idea of homology, what is it doing? Is uplifting area from space into time. In this way, it is possible to bridge in time events irrespectively of their distance in space. This is what underlies quantum technology. So we abduct the notion of area from space homologically through the helix as a universal covering of the circle. The question is now how do we think of the real line in quantum space? And the only way to think of it is as the helix itself, the continuum which is made by the helix itself. Of course, as we said, this continuum now brings in built the discrete, the discretum of countable windings. And this is what characterizes the quantum real line in comparison to the classical real line. So the classical real line, okay, which is the classical geometric line, transforms, transfigures 
two helix in quantum space. And this helix is universally covering the underlying circle. In this way now, we can grasp what Gauss, called the prince of mathematics, was writing and what was the meaning of his text, which was contained in a letter that he sent and contained into his uh, work, in his collected works, where he says that we can understand the complex plane, okay, our screen, equipped with the technology of the complex analysis and complex calculus, how we understand it as a domain of shadows of shadows. So this is a very mysterious and very uh, cryptic sentence that now we have the means to uh, decode. And that's the beauty of it. And it, of course, it is not accidental that the student of Gauss, Riemann, conceived topologically the covering principle. Because the, the helix manifesting, not geometrically, simply at the operational level, but as a bridge which resolves the obstacle of multiple connectivity belongs to Riemann and of course Riemann was embedded in the way of thinking of his mentor and teacher Gauss. So how we can think now of our screen here equipped with this complex technology as a domain of shadows of shadows? This is the question. And let's try to address this issue as follows. In the real domain, with the technology of the real exponential function, and the role of the exponential function as a neutral element, as a neutrality condition, with respect to differentiation and integration, the real value calculus, what allow us to do is to characterize areas of shadows in terms of color. And for this, the instrumental role was the real valued logarithm in the Euler basis, because the values of the logarithm they characterize geometric areas of shadows in terms of colors. And this was the bridge from the time frequency domain, where the frequency now was referring to the spectrum of light, the continuum spectrum of light, with time characterized by the uncertainty principle in the real domain. So with the real technology, we were able to give colors to areas through logarithms. So we can distinguish areas, not only in terms of rational magnitudes, but in terms of their color through a spectrum of light. This was the domain of shadows. Here we talk about shadows of shadows. What is this extra characteristic? The extra characteristic is precisely given by the homology now. It's the abstraction of area from space. If we think now in quantum space of the real line as a helix, 
we have through the continuum now the characterization of areas through the logarithm, but we have something more. And this more is what comes through the windings. How we can qualify now the windings? The idea of Riemann was to qualify the different windings as different branches of a surface which is bounded in the affoldment of these helices. So, you think of the outer circle here, so you have an annulus, you think of the outer circle universally covered by this helix here, and you have the inner circle universally covered by this helix. There is a surface now which is bounded in between these two helices. And there is an area which is enclosed here. We want to see it and to distinguish it in terms of color. We can do it with a real logarithm function, but we have the extra issue of windings. So what Riemann thought of, and this is what underlies now the inversion of the complex exponential function to the complex logarithm function, is this notion of branching. So the issue of simple connectivity is achieved by branching this universal covering surface in distinctive layers which can be thought of as different uh, branches pertaining to simple connectivity. This means now that the complex exponential function cannot be inverted globally. It can be inverted only along different branches. So the notion of a single branch pertains to the notion of topological localization in the quantum space. If we want to think now of the exponential function in terms of this topology of the universal covering space of the circle, and since the real line in quantum space is understood in terms of the helix, we understand the complex exponential function as the projection, as the projection from the helix to the circle. In this way, a section of this projection, and has to be a section because as we said, the complex exponential is not globally invertible, the phenomenon of branching that we have in quantum space, but it can be inverted branch-wise with respect to distinct branches, which of course can be glued together in non-singular regions, And this now a section in a branch will give the notion of the complex logarithm as the local topological inverse of the complex exponential function. Let's proceed to see another characteristic of quantum space which is inbuilt on how we have to think 
of the real line in quantum space. The issue now is that the unfolding of the circle into a helix, so the universal covering, can be performed with respect to two distinct orientations. So it is also a topological characteristic of orientation now, which is inbuilt in the conception of the real line in quantum space, something that we did not have on the classical real line. As you can very easily see, the unfolding can take place either in an anti-clockwise way, following this type of circulation, or it can be performed in a clockwise way, following the inverse orientation. So there is a binary code which is inbuilt in the universal covering of the helix with respect to these orientations. This is an extra sign now that this universal covering helix is able to resonate with the harmonic domain because this double orientability descends from the harmonic domain. Recall that in the harmonic domain the harmonic frequencies emerge out of self-interference of a propagating wave towards some bound which is reflected back and essentially self-interferes. So we can think now of the reflected harmonic standing wave as corresponding to the opposite orientability of the helix. So both of them pertain to the understanding of the harmonic frequencies. This is what is inbuilt in this double orientability of the helix as a universal covering of the circle. The issue of enantiomorphism or chirality. Let's come back now to see the things because we have to keep in mind this uh, comparatistic perspective, so we have to be conscious of its step, how it relates with the memory which is already inbuilt up to now. And this memory is what is inbuilt in the real exponential function. Now, this is important because through this we can figure out how the distinct per perspectives on calculus of Leibniz and Newton that they are convergent and they give rise to the same calculus. Recall that if you consider the real exponential function so this is the graph of the real value exponential function. The fact that this is a neutral element in the worlds of differentiation and integration, so in the world open up through these inverse bridges, the fact that the exponential function is invariant under integration can be very easily understood through this orthogonal Pythagorean triangle. So again, 
through a right angle geometrically. Of course, the qualification comes from considering the tangents at each point of the graph and figuring out the area which is included in this region. The important point, which is what underlies the neutrality condition of the real exponential function, is that the subtangent, these intervals here on the real line, are constant, they are invariant. This is what characterizes the neutrality of the real exponential function. So, all these orthogonal triangles, because of the constancy of the subtangents, can be harmonically now, parallelly transported inside the orthogonal triangle, which is erected at each point of the graph of this function, so at any time through the tangent. And this is how we find the invariance of the area. So the invariance of the, the real exponential function under integration. Now I would like to invite you to think how this can be transferred to the domain of the circle. The issue is that this property pertains to the real exponential function. So by extending now the exponential function to the circle, what we do is that we rotate this orthogonal triangle four times until it gets back to itself. This is very easy to see through a series of four rotations. And this is now what underlies, from the perspective now of calculus, the conception of the imaginary axis in relation to the exponential function. The idea is that if you rotate according to the right angle, this orthogonal triangle four times, it gets back to itself, preserving, preserving, of course, the area which is included here. And now compare it with the fact that the imaginary unit, if squared, gives the minus one, so the opposite of the unity, but if it is raised to the fourth power, equals the unity. The fact now that the imaginary unit raised to the fourth power equals the unity can be grasped by the invariance which is enclosed in the fourfold rotation of this orthogonal triangle under the graph of the exponential function defined by the altitude at any point, the constant subtangent and, of course, the tangent at any point. In this way, everything we know from real calculus, it is the memory, of course, of the real exponential function, is encoded in an invariant way in the complex domain. So we do not lose the power 
of real calculus by this extension. This is very important because all the technology and all the memory which is already built in the technology of the real valued exponential function is transferred invariantly under the extension of the exponential function to the circle. And through this, we are also able to grasp the fact that the fourfold power of the imaginary unit get us back to the unity. So this orthogonal triangle, if rotated according to a right angle four times, comes back to itself, preserving, of course, the area which is included here. So from this perspective, it is the imaginary rotation performed in terms of the complex exponential function, which is the new element that our calculus has inbuilt in contrast to the real exponential function. And the fact that the number of rotations repeat in integer units, what we saw before in the universal covering of the circle by the helix, is what gives us the possibility to access now through these bridges the domain of harmonics and to liberate area from space. So, through the universal covering of the helix and through the homology of the partition spectrum, so each block contains all circulations sharing the same number of windings around, we are able to abduct any area from geometric space and any area can be transferred in this way to quantum space but independently of rigid geometry one more thing and we will close this quite dense lecture is a manifestation of this universal covering in terms of the complex exponential function. We already know that we can think of the universal covering helix as projects now to the circle we can think of this projection that this is exactly what the exponential function is doing. So it is a projection from the real line in quantum space, which appears as a helix, to the circle S. It can be inversed only locally with respect to distinct branches of this helicoidal surface which is inbuilt between the covering helices. So the complex logarithm leading to branching, so the simple connectivity is not the simple connectivity of a line but it is a simple connectivity which comes out of gluing all these different branches together along non-singular regions and this is now what leads at the further stage to the qualification of the real line in quantum space as a sieve it is what is actually achieved 
through the complex exponential function. So this was the, our starting point, and this is how we managed to re-manifest our real line in quantum space as a helix coming together with this discrete partition spectrum, which underlies what we call the quantum behavior. So what is that characterizes quantum behavior and why it is called like this is the discrete quanta. So the quanta, the physical quanta, are not particles. They are not particles. They are homology classes. So they are equivalence classes, blocks of the partition spectrum, which are gained out of the abduction of area from geometric space. And it is this quanta now which afford the encoding and decoding of the discrete invariant harmonic frequencies. If we come now to Gauss expression shadows of shadows, the first level of shadows is the qualification of the shadows in terms of geometric area expressed through the real logarithm as a color. The deeper level, the shadows of shadows, pertains essentially to what we call quantum space. In this way, the area of shadows does not belong to the ground. The area of shadows can be homologically uplifting in discrete branches. So we have a shadow qualified in terms of a color, but this color now is not a color which pertains to absorption, so it is only absorbing information, but it can also emit, radiate information. Radiation of information is based precisely on this uplifting of geometrical area from the geometric context. So we have through homology, through the homology, which is given essentially by the complex logarithm through all the distinct branches, the abduction of area from geometric space as area pertaining to radiation. And in this way, we can, with the quantum technology now, we can understand radiation and we base our current technology on this new phenomenon, which has to be understood in terms of all the discrete quanta. So the quanta are not particles, they are homology classes, they pertain to the partition spectrum of the helix as a universal covering of the multiply connected circle.